From Avon to Alliance, Cleveland to Conneaut, NOPAC is working to keep your natural gas and electric rates consistently affordable. We are 240 Ohio communities using our collective strength to buy in bulk and then pass the benefits along to you. For more than two decades, we've worked together to help you keep more of the money you earn. Just imagine what we can do together in the decades ahead. To learn more, visit nopec.org. Warning, we've got an annual profanity quota and this is our last chance to meet it. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Factor and by God Awful Movies Live in Orlando, March 2nd. God Awful Movies Live, because all the other ways you might see Eli's ass cheeks are far scarier. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, I'm Seamus. And even though I'm 13 years old and probably don't know what I'm talking about, I still can assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy, monkey people. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go talk about Philly sports now. Nailed it. It's December 28th. And it's Pledge of Allegiance Day? Yeah, because nothing proves the commies wrong like a weird little oath that you force your kids to say, I'm no illusions. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick, and from the world's best pizza and bagels, New Jersey, <laughs> and way across Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we hurry through all the headlines we missed in 2023. Heath will reappear just to rebut my bagel joke. <laughs> yeah, right. And we'll finally bury that goddamn David Icke book. But first, the diet tribe. December 28th should be its own holiday where we gather together with our friends and celebrate surviving all the family bullshit of the holidays. Now, in that regard, I, I'm pretty lucky. My family knows what I do for a living and knows that I'm better at arguing about religion and politics than they are, and, you know, we don't talk about it. My parents have religious beliefs. The last thing they want to hear is what I think of them, so that subject just never comes up. And while my extended family has its share of Trumpers, I sure the fuck ain't voluntarily spending any time with them, so the gatherings that I do attend don't tend to have a lot of political arguments either. But even from that enviable position, I don't come home with a tongue free of bite marks. There's always some kind of bullshit dying to be commented on, right? Whether it's cousin so-and-so treating their psoriasis with crystals, or uncle what's-his-name recommending a good chiropractor, or my dad sharing one of the many conspiratorial ways in which they get you, right? And of course, that's part of the course for us, right? The, the, the curse of the skeptical atheist is that in pretty much any social gathering, either we're miserable or everybody else is. I mean, I guess there's a breed of who-gives-a-shit apatheist who can commingle with theists all the time, and it's rarely an issue. But if you're like us, right, if you're not just non-religious but anti-religious, it can be physically painful. Because it's not just that you disagree with what's being said, it's that you realize that it's harmful. Right, So the sentence your, your clenched teeth are holding back isn't, I disagree with you, it's, you know that worldview can be directly linked to increases in teen suicide, right? And in nearly every group, they force the issue. It's not just family. You start socializing with a new group of people, and it's all but inevitable that somebody's going to invite you to their church or, or tell you to check out their psychic or their naturopath. And it's very rare that a simple no thank you is sufficient to rebuff this invite. If you say no to church, you have to hear all about how their church isn't like the other churches you've been to before. It has a rock band. Right, and eventually you have to be like, does your church also believe in an omnipotent, omnibenevolent being that decides which kids should and shouldn't have face cancer to get the no to stick? And that leads me to my New Year's resolution this year. For you. I have one, I don't have, I know I'm supposed to make New Year's resolutions for myself, but fuck all that. It never works. Plus, I'm way better at diagnosing other people's problems than my own, and sure, you can ignore it, 
but that just makes it more resolution. Like if you think about it, so one way or the other, you're stuck with it. Here, this is your New Year's resolution. This year, I resolve for you to invite an atheist into your home that's never been there before. All right, so a couple of obvious caveats that I, I need to acknowledge here. Not everyone has a home they can invite people to. Many of you have weird roommate situations or you have tight quarters or you live with family that wouldn't be welcoming or you just don't have a home that you're comfortable inviting other people to. So all of you are exempted. And while I figure you already knew that, I thought it was worth bringing you up if for no reason but to emphasize to everybody else here how important a resolution it could be. Now, of course, the biggest challenge here is probably going to be meeting an atheist worthy of a home visit. For a lot of you, there could be an atheist meetup or skeptics in the pub group or something like that. But if you live in a town like the one I'm in, it's going to be a lot harder. Hell, you might even have to bus an atheist in from out of town or make your place available to one who's passing through. And I know that might seem awkward, but think about it. Christians do this shit all the time, right? Welcome random Christians they've never met into their home. And from my experience, atheist skeptics have a lot more in common than two random members of the same brand of Christianity, And look, in my experience, most of the time when we try to do shit like this, right, when atheists are like, oh, we need to meet up more or whatever, we overshoot. Instead of aiming for playing board games with a few other skeptics, we start with like a, let's have a monthly meetup with speakers in a service project. And as often as not, what you end up with is one really good meeting and then diminishing returns. And then the whole thing feels like a fucking failure because it's so much less than you set out to do. But if what you set out to do was a single visit... Any echo that comes after that is just a bonus. Look, I know I probably talk about the community angle here too often, but there's a profound sense of self-actualization that happens when you're surrounded by people who you can be yourself around. And nothing brings the value of that camaraderie to the forefront of your mind like spending a few days chewing on your tongue in a desperate effort to be somebody else. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is nobody. And I'm not here either, actually, because we're all off seeing family this week and we had to record all this stuff in advance. But in anticipation of that, we've been saving up headlines all month and we've got plenty. But before we get to those, we're going to pause for a word from this week's sponsor, Factor. Oh, man, I'm going to be so prepared. So prepare. Hey, Eli. (laughs) What's with all the veggies here? Uh, Oh, hey, no, I was just um, I've been up all night. Meal prepping. Meal prepping? Yeah. Yeah. It's all part of my New Year's resolution. It's actually super time saver. Is it? You say you've been doing this how long? Uh, 11 hours now. Right. Right. Well, Eli, if you want to cross meal prep off your list the easy way, why don't you just do it with Factor? What's... (laughs) Factor. Sorry. What's Factor? What's Factor? Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. Wait, ready to eat so I don't have to cook? Nope. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are delivered to your door. They're ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Okay, but what about variety and special diets like mine and stuff? Treat yourself to high quality of delicious meals over the holidays. Choose from over 35 chef crafted meals every week that support a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences, whether it's calorie smart, vegan and veggie, protein plus, or one of several other wholesome options. I don't know, Noah. I heard those meal delivery boxes are bad for the environment. Well, with Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions and source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices. Amazing. All right, Noah, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Head to factormeals.com slash scathing50 and use the code scathing50 to get 50% off. That's code scathing50 at factormeals.com slash scathing50 to get 50% off. Thanks, Noah. I'm definitely going to give it a try. So do you want to stop chopping and get some sleep? Eh, I'm almost done with this carrot. That's a rolling pin. Mm Mm-hmm, almost done. Okay. And now, back to headlines from the past, already in progress. And in lying in your transphobic bed news, a small religious school in Vermont is suing state officials after they were banned from participating in athletic and academic events because they refused to let their girls' basketball team compete against another team that had a transgender player. Cue the sad violin music. 
Yeah. Also cue millions of evangelical bigots all over the country who are definitely avid fans of girls high school basketball mm -hmm. in Vermont and have very <laughs> strong opinions about the competition in Division 4 in Vermont. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Their cries of how dare you refuse to let us compete in sports just because we refuse to compete in sports rings a bit hollow <laughs> to me. <laughs> Yes, the Mid-Vermont Christian School was supposed to compete against Long Trail School back in February, but decided to forfeit the game when they found out that one of Long Trail's players was trans. In my book, a forfeit is just as good as a win, so go Long Trail Mountain Lions! Extra Fuck points yeah. for not being bigots! Hell yeah. <laughs> also, according to the website for Mid-Vermont Christian School, quote, the women's basketball team is a group of young ladies enjoying the sport of basketball while they learn and grow in their faith in Christ, end quote. So uh, instead of doing a bigot forfeit, maybe learn and grow at running a fucking two, three zone on defense. Get there good you go. is what I'm saying. Thank you. Exactly. D up. Yeah, I think, I think mid-Vermont Christian school is about one generation past denouncing women's basketball as satanic for requiring young ladies to bounce up and down. So yeah, like, I, I don't know that they really have anything to say here. There's definitely members of the board who aren't sure about shorts. Yeah. So <laughs> the school. Short pants? <laughs> in this century? In my country? In West Virginia? <laughs> Anyways, the suit says that the school was, quote, irreparably harmed by being denied participation. Really? And, quote, losing out on playing competitive sports as well as academic competitions, end quote. Not adding, and damn it, that's what we were trying to do to trans people. Right, yes. yes. Also, <laughs> yes, you're being harmed and losing out. Fucking good. That was yes, the you point. You did it. That's what we were trying for. Yeah. Why do they think but our bigotry had a consequence is such an ironclad argument all the time? Uh, I don't know. Unfortunately for the school, despite their particular mission to make sure to oppress anyone who isn't a straight Christian, they are still subject to Vermont's Principals Association, or VPA, in order to participate in interschool competitions. The VPA's executive director, Jay Nicholas, said that the school violated the association's, quote, commitment to racial, gender fair, and disability awareness, end quote, and on gender identity, Nicholas said, quote, if you don't want to follow VPA rules, that's fine, but then you're just not a VPA member. It's fairly simple. That is pretty simple. That's really all we're going to really say about it, end quote. <laughs> okay. Listen, nice. Big at school. I forget what you're fucking called. You're going to be fine. You, you can always drop out of Vermont's Division 4 and go back to the Sports League for the Association of Christian Schools International, where you used to play. I'm sure all the millions of Christian people who chimed in about this news item are also big fans of that other league I just mentioned. I mean, <laughs> unless they're all lying, you're all set in terms of your fan base. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fine. Right. Don't worry about right. it. Yeah. So for their part, the Mid-Vermont Christian School says it was acting on its own religious beliefs, which they state are mainly concerned with the, quote, mind of Christ. But in the classic words of the poets, she doesn't even go here. <laughs> <laughs> also, the phrase mind of Christ, that's just meaningless buzzword nonsense for Christian people. But just for the record, the Bible was written hundreds of years after the historical Jesus existed. Anyone claiming to know the mind of Christ is just saying whatever they want right now and adding a 2,000-year-old rabbi's name to it to make it better somehow. Mm -hmm. The argument that, like, the mind of James Madison wanted the right to own AR-15s right now is actually way more tenable than the mind of Christ argument they're trying to make. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. When originalism isn't originalist enough for you. Yeah. Unoriginalism, if you will. <laughs> yeah. And the school clearly has no grasp of irony because the lawsuit says, quote, the state is not entitled, nor is it constitutional, to force private religious schools across the state to follow that orthodoxy as a condition in participating in Vermont's tuitioning program and the state's athletic association, end quote. Jeez, they even used the word orthodoxy and they right? didn't hear they it. Did. Jesus. <laughs> On a pleasant note, however, I should point out that it is worth noting that Vermont is one of the few states that even allows transgender students to compete in high school sports, which is why, as we all know, every high school sport in Vermont is dominated by an army of gank-to-the-gills trans children. No, it's not. Children are children. Yep. Stop being weird. 
Yeah. Also, their maple syrup candy is just mwah. Oh, love it. So you gotta good. love it. You don't have to. You got Bernie over there. You got Mitt, Bernie Mittens. Come on. Oh, that's pretty cool. Bernie me? Bernie me? Big Long Trails fan. Anyways, the story that I read from Fox <laughs> News also points out that Long Trail competed in 20 games before a school even had an issue, which I think is just more evidence to support that mid-Vermont just didn't have the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Laying my chips down now. If they win this lawsuit, the next one is going to be suing to be allowed to answer that the Earth is 6,000 years old and that the flood killed the dinosaurs in those academic competitions they were so worried about. <laughs> yeah, they're coming for the mathletes next. Pi is 3.5. being irreparably <laughs> harmed by facts. <laughs> and in conspiratory news, nice. there's an old tale in Jewish folklore about the rabbi who brings to life a lump of clay in the form of a golem a mindless and powerful servant to do his bidding. And in many versions of the story, the golem goes rogue and eventually leads to the death of his creator. And in 16th century France, soldiers laying siege to a castle would employ specialist infantry who would use a small primitive bomb or a petard to destroy the castle gate. And sometimes these petardiers would fail to escape the area before the bomb exploded and they'd find themselves thrown into the air or hoisted, if you will, by their own petard. Damn it, Marsh, we let you on the show with Heath one time and you're already being converted to fun facts. <laughs> what did he say to you? This is a good one. Everybody gets the phrase wrong, too. So, nice. Yeah. And in a long-running nature documentary series, a particularly inventive or wily coyote would try to catch <laughs> a, a rather quick and evasive roadrunner via an ingenious device or two, only to find himself getting caught in the very trap he was employing to catch the roadrunner. <laughs> yeah, it's a great docuseries. It's like Hamlet, but with um, better dialogue, I would say. How dare you? <laughs> anyway. Um, Thank you, Marsh. All that being said, I read this week that the Tory government in the UK are having to give their MPs special training on how to avoid falling for conspiracy theories in order to prevent them from being radicalized by culture war talking points, anti-vaccine propaganda, and climate denialism. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. In my mind, they're all being forced to listen to skeptics with a K at gunpoint, right? <laughs> right. Or, or sausage point. Whatever you guys use instead of guns, yeah, I'm right. never sure. <laughs> So this move comes after former Tory MP and regular feature of my Skeptic Rad stories, Andrew Bridgen was radicalized by COVID vaccine misinformation, essentially since his encounter with the Who's Woo Hall of Famer Asim Malhotra, including claiming that security services around the world knew about COVID in the summer of 2019. And he also shared a conspiracy theory that the US Department of Defense was responsible for both the virus and the vaccines. No, it can't, they can't be because those things were successful. No, sorry, I'm sorry. The U.S. <laughs> Department of Defense, they couldn't invade Cuba. That is an island the size of Tennessee that we have surrounded on two sides by default. <laughs> <laughs> so Bridgen has subsequently defected from the Tory party to an even more far-right party, and he's subsequently taken a conscious break from reality. But clearly, he's not the only Tory at risk, which has now resulted in the leader of the Commons, Penny Mordaunt, introducing a service that will, quote, help explain some of the most prominent conspiracy theories circulating online, including those relating to the Ukraine war and anti-Semitism. OK, as usual, Marsh, check your UK privilege. If the Republican Party did the same thing, it would make their congresspeople less electable. But also it wouldn't work because those are stupid people. <laughs> like, our evil party is slightly bound by reality. That's you. That's what you said. That's, yeah, that's what you're saying, Marsh. Embarrassing yourself. But the thing Sit about all this is, right? tube seats. A, a, hu a huge chunk of the Tory party's susceptibility to conspiracy theory comes from their own prolific attachment to pushing the big red button marked culture wall red meat. You know, when Andrew Bridgen wasn't comparing the COVID vaccine to the Holocaust, he was questioning the consensus on climate change and warning about the horrible, scary danger posed by trans kids. Positions that are still a primary part of the rhetoric coming out of Rishi Sunak's government. Yeah, no, to be clear here, the lesson they're going for is how to avoid believing these conspiracies, not how to avoid spreading them. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, we're drug dealers. No getting high on our own supply, okay? <laughs> right. End up like Andrew. <laughs> So 
it's starting to seem like the Tory party are finding out that you can't get all of your political positions out of a crate with Acme written on the side and then be surprised when your conspiracy <laughs> theory rocket blows up while you're still sat on it. There you go. And in growing pain in the ass news, Kirk Cameron wants schools to ditch the scholastic book fairs for a right-wing alternative because things that are actually pretty conservative by any normal standards are not conservative enough until we attach Christ to it. After all, we have Christian pop songs, Christian fashion week, and Christian poker chips now. Why not Christian book fairs? These are the same people who would insult Queen Bey by making her song Single Ladies into the Christian version Modest Ladies. <laughs> Clearly, these people are already monsters even without Kirk Cameron. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, but like Christian Book Fair, it seems like it'd just be like a bunch of copies of the same book surrounded by book-shaped piles of ash, no? <laughs> and also, Eli, Christian poker chips, that's a thing, mm -hmm. you know? On the third day, Jesus raised again, but Peter called it. And then <laughs> Jesus had three kings. Well, he had one king, <laughs> but he tried to argue it's the same as three kings. And uh, uh, right. Yeah. Judas had already cashed out by that point, so it didn't really matter. Uh, yes. Excellent. As we all know, Kirk Cameron has spent most of his post-growing pains career subjecting us to his particular, shall we say, flavor of Christianity. The kind where he used Jesus as a way to make sure anyone who's LGBTQ, including teens and children, feel, you know, completely demonized and unwelcome in society. Surely, Mike Seaver could have at least been grounded for being racist, sexist, and homophobic. But I digress. Cameron, who calls scholastic book fairs controllers in part of the woke matrix, end quote, is asking people to support Skytree Books instead as a conservative Christian alternative. The woke matrix. So a film by two trans siblings written as an allegory for the trans experience but a woke version of that. Yeah. It's PC gone mad. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So yeah, Skytree is, surprise, surprise, owned by Brave Books, huh. which, I don't know if you guys remember this, just happens to publish Kirk Cameron's titles. I, I gotta wonder if maybe this is actually just a ploy to make more money and actually has nothing to do with religious beliefs at all. Now, normally, we are all in favor of getting kids to read here on The Scathing Atheist, but even Skytree can't compete with Scholastic in terms of content. Skytree has vetted and approved about 200 children's books compared to the over a thousand that are approved by Scholastic. Aren't both of those numbers small to you? Yes. For yeah, both I was yes. the same yes. thing. Yes, yep. absolutely. What are you doing? It's children's, you can read too much children's books so fast. <laughs> no, we'll see ya. <laughs> Listen on, Heath Henry, because you're going to learn what the problem is here. Are you ready? Only 100 of those Scholastic books are categorized as LGBTQ children's books. And of course, no one is forcing parents to choose those books for their kids, but you know how this particular flavor of Christian rolls, if it exists but is not directly about Christ, we're being oppressed. So yeah, the yeah. 100 books is too many. So this flavor of Christian rolls, honestly, that sounds so dry and mealy. I'll stick with Pillsbury. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, much. that's fair. That's fair. Thought you might appreciate it down in Georgia. And if that's not enough, Skytree and Brave Books apparently can't even confirm what books they have in their catalog, or even if Brave Books is their only publisher, <laughs> only that their titles promote family values, which, of course, Scholastic does too. They just do it while also featuring gay characters or stories that admit racism exists, you know, the kind of stuff sure to turn children into soup-wielding Antifa murderers. Right, because good Christians don't want people using books to indoctrinate and spread propaganda. That would be unethical. <laughs> yes, exactly. Heath gets it. And they had dibs. <laughs> yeah, but it actually gets better. Friend of the show and good universe Heath Enright, Hemet Meta, over at the Friendly Atheist blog, asked Brave spokesperson Aaron Kukowski to release a list of the book titles and publishers that Skytree will carry. But the request was denied. Kukowski merely noted in her reply email that Skytree will not carry, quote, anything that's not age appropriate, uses sexually explicit language or images, causes gender confusion, or that's racially divisive. Also, they will not carry anything published by Scholastic, end quote, which I love that she says that like it's a decision and not 
we're starting a McDonald's, so we're not allowed to serve Burger King here. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Look, we don't know what books we have. To know that, we'd have to read them, and that's for nerds. What we know is that our man books fuck lady books. That's what matters, all right? <laughs> Damn it. But they want schools to switch to Skytree, but they can't tell those schools which books they stock. How do they expect that conversation to go? Like, do they think schools just order books by weight and volume? <laughs> or, or do they think school libraries just like the element of surprise? Like it's a literary loot crate? Like, yeah, what's, what we got this week? Yes, absolutely, Marsh. Absolutely. Side note, it's obviously been a few years, but I don't remember the Scholastic Book Fair carrying... Uh, sexually explicit materials, no, you know, and, no. and if they did, I just want to say, I absolutely wasted my parents' money on all those Garfield books, okay? <laughs> I just uh, <laughs> want to be clear. I actually once read a book from Scholastic about a mouse who ate a cookie, and then he wanted another cookie. It was really disturbing stuff. It was pretty yeah, that's, I get that's it. That's basically I, I, a mukbang anyway, right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's unclear as to why... <laughs> I do remember that, yeah. Uh, so it's unclear as to why Cameron is suddenly promoting Skytree, but I have a hunch it's that Scholastic recently reversed its very unpopular decision to make books about race and LGBTQ issues optional for schools at their book fairs, saying, what? quote, we understand now that the separate nature of the collection has caused confusion and feelings of exclusion, end quote. Not adding... But you have to admit, us making books about black people and gays optional in the same decision was a pretty heavy-handed hint as to what you should have been doing. I mean, yeah, were you really going to bring this to us? Yeah. You can't bring this to us. Come on. And the only cure, of course, is creating watered-down Christian versions of beloved children's books so kids hate reading altogether because every book their parents buy them is fucking terrible. Yep. Carol Seaver would never have done this to us. Is what <laughs> Thank I'm you. I just love that statement by Scholastic. They're like, upon further reflection, having a separate but equal book fair for the black books was a terrible idea. We should have seen it right away. Our bad. Sorry. Especially when those black books were listed at three-fifths the price of the books about white people. Oh, yeah, no, it's That's on us. Yeah. <laughs> it's on us. So, Luckily, it's very unlikely that Skytree will take over Scholastic anytime soon. Even the Christian Book Fair claims to have over 100 schools signed up for their fairs. That's compared to the 120,000 fairs Scholastic has. So I guess pornographic Garfield is safe for now. Oh, well, it's good to know. And fucking a cookie. And in barbecue Ron news. Uh, Fantastic. In 20, not really, though. In 2017... Denmark repealed its 334-year-old blasphemy law, and there was much rejoicing. We did some on this show. But now, a mere seven years hence, they kind of got to missing it. And so now, pending a signature from their queen, they've welcomed it back in the form of a new prohibition on, quote, inappropriate treatment of writings with significant religious importance for a recognized religious community, end quote. Idiots. And much like that divorced couple you know who's getting remarried, this is a terrible fucking idea. <laughs> yeah, listen, you can still fuck the blasphemy laws if you want. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> Just don't remarry, obviously. Uh, right. Yes. Wow. Okay. I mean, I thought Haley and Tom's wedding was lovely. Okay. Heath, so but I mean, to... if that's what you want to say publicly about Tom and Haley's <laughs> wedding, Keith Enright, then I mean, gosh. The magic was meh, but I thought the wedding was cool. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you, Morgan? <laughs> so, yeah, so this is in response to a recent spate of Quran burnings in Denmark and neighboring Sweden. Or if you want to put the blame where the blame goes, it's in response to a recent spate of Muslims freaking the fuck out and threatening violent retribution over said Quran burnings. It's a capitulation to terrorism and directly. Lawmakers supporting the bill in Parliament cited increasing risks to national security as a driver for the change. Over the summer, hundreds of Iraqi protesters stormed the Danish embassy in Baghdad over this shit. And Justice Minister Peter Hummelgar justified the law by pointing out that Quran burnings, quote, damaged the security of Danes both abroad and at home, end quote. So instead of protecting them, the government has opted to allow Muslim mob violence to dictate their policy. Yeah, their policy is we don't negotiate with terrorists because we already did what they want ahead of right, time we already to play No together. negotiation required. Yeah. What the fuck? And look, it's easy for some people to dismiss this 
as an anti-bigotry thing, right? Because that's mostly what it is. Most of the people out there burning Qurans are Christian bigots protesting immigration from Muslim majority countries. And free speech shouldn't protect a person's ability to like, you know, scream slurs at minorities as they walk by or whatever. But even if that was a legitimate argument, it's also far from universal. Qurans are often burned as a protest against the religion itself. That's a motivation I have a vested interest in protecting. Right. Hell, the highest profile Quran burning in Sweden came from a Muslim immigrant who was trying to highlight Muslim oppression and intolerance, which, to his credit, he did. Nailed it. Yeah. Got it in one. I feel like we have to say this all the time, but you can't reasonably accommodate fucking magic. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's like a law that says you have to pretend I didn't put the card inside the lemon ahead of time. You have to <laughs> pretend. That. Why is this complicated? Okay, that, I mean, first of all, that's a bad example because that should be a law. <laughs> Second of all, there's also just a lot of problems with giving paper magic powers, right? For, for example, if I may, uh, the holy text of Eli Bosnickism is now a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Bam, Denmark, you just became a bidet-exclusive country. Yeah. Or are you bigots? <laughs> now, as disappointing as this law is, apparently it was almost worse the initial draft of the law would have banned the desecration of, quote, all objects of significant religious importance, end quote. But eventually they realized what a fucking nightmare that would be, and they narrowed it down to just books. And technically, you are allowed to still burn a Quran. You just can't do it publicly or privately if you film it and then broadcast that to a wide audience, which is awesome, right? Because free speech still totally counts when it's restricted to the privacy of your own home, right? Cool. Yeah, you can burn a Quran on Eli's blog, but not a podcast. That's what the, <laughs> the hey, is. hey, you could burn the Library of Alexandria during the auto ads. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility <laughs> not there. A, right, so, and, and look, I, I get that we probably don't have universal agreement within our audience on shit like this. It feels gross to side with Islamophobes that are belittling the culture of an oppressed minority in their country. I get that. But there are a fuck ton of steps between endorsing what those people are doing and outlawing what those people are doing. And the idea that a nation should be held responsible for the protests that it allows is a terrifying precedent, as is the one where you allow threats of violence from foreign mobs to dictate your national policy. Yep. Obviously. Come on, Denmark. D up. And in Proud Boys and Proud Moms news, up until somewhat recently, moms have had a pretty decent run in the PR department. <laughs> They're dominant in the field of tattoos and oak tag signs at arenas. Mm -hmm. Delightful <laughs> Allison Janney won two Emmys for playing one on a popular sitcom. <laughs> and from what I hear, they even have their own category on various websites. That's cool. Sorry, what you hear? Yep. Yeah. What you hear? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Grapevine says, but that near flawless reputation came crashing down in 2021 when Moms for Liberty entered the scene and besmirched the good name of the family matriarch. And all of a sudden, your mama's worldview is so ugly jokes weren't so easy to repudiate. Ah, oh, cut to Monica Cole disgustedly taking out her headphones. How dare you, Heath? That was a <laughs> pre-smirched word. And you know it. <laughs> And in a long line of racist, embarrassing, and embarrassingly racist scandals that organization has racked up, promoting a Christmas toy drive for literally, this is serious, whites only is definitely what? up there. Oh. I mean, it got to be top five, at least. That's seriously what they did this year. Moms for Liberty is doing a whites only toy drive. Wow. It's like... I feel like this came from a what could be controversial enough to distract from our rapey sex triangle meeting, right? <laughs> it sure did. Yep. Yeah. And for the record, I said we should make a croakum bush, but they wouldn't listen. <laughs> so, you know, that's their loss. <laughs> All right. And a big thanks to Brian for the link. Scathingnews at gmail.com. Wait, 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 wait. Heath, are you telling me that not only can folks send us the latest atheism news at scathingnews at gmail.com, but they'll be entered to win one of our limited edition atheist elf on a shelf alternatives watching Wittgenstein, That's who doesn't judge you for the evil you do, but does want to have a discussion about you and the failures of the boundary of language around those yeah. behaviors. Cool language stuff. <laughs> we, we also have a an elf-themed one. It's Noam Chomsky. Oh, yeah! We moved away from the rhyme to like an alliteration, and then I did a different... It's fine. So <laughs> here's the official announcement from the Liberty Moms. 
It was on Telegram, by the way. Oh. Really bad start. <laughs> Their Telegram channel is called Moms for Liberty Uncensored. Uncensored. Which is, unsubscribed. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sadly, not what I was expecting when I saw Moms for Liberty Uncensored <laughs> as a title. They shared a flyer for a, again, this is serious, for a whites-only toy drive wow. organized by the likewise colored supremacy group known as the National Justice Party. They dubbed the toy drive Operation White Christmas. And like even Rudolph would say it's a little too on the nose. Come on, seriously? <laughs> the non-miscegenated toy drive aims to assist the downtrodden white people of America and all the others need not apply. According to the flyer, quote, in the interest of racial justice and pro-white advocacy, you can't say those things at the same fucking time, whatever. Mm -mm. <laughs> in the interest of those two things, we want to ensure that white families in need are not turned away as they frequently are by other charitable efforts, end quote. Are they? Though, <laughs> so, so wait, what happened, I think it literally is that they probably saw that public assistance was disproportionately going to minorities and they assumed that the problem was that the, they were discriminating against the needy white folks. Exactly what happened. <laughs> that is what exactly happened. what happened. All right, everybody. Shut it down. We found the perfect metaphor for the religious right. I assume we just um, <laughs> play this story on a loop from now on. Uh, yeah. What are you guys going to do now that the podcast is over? I was thinking butcher. Maybe we could do <laughs> butchers. <laughs> cheese monger. butcher. Huh? Butcher sounds fun. I was thinking cheesemonger. Ooh. Nice. Meat and cheese. <laughs> All right. Well, of course, the flyer, it's limited for space. So the National Justice Party doesn't provide any examples of the rampant toy-based racial injustice against the whites. But the ad did state it would be using anonymous methods to deliver the donated items. Oh. Almost like they're aware they should be very, very ashamed of something, but they can't quite put their pasty little fingers on it. <laughs> Let me guess. They're going to donate the toys while wearing a hood? <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, Moms for Liberty... They've yet to respond to the backlash, although it's not clear if they even understand the problem or why there would be backlash. And considering the co-founder of their puritanical bigot group is now, as we said earlier, embroiled in a giant scandal after her husband got accused of sexual assault by the third member of their now ex-thruple, they've got their controversy plate kind of full. Bottom line, I'll be sending... Nothing but black Barbies to that toy drive. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. And in none too angry news, anyone who's come out the other side of a strict Catholic school upbringing can vouch for a nun's capacity for violence. Any indiscretion, however minor, could potentially be met with a swift smack of the ruler, an angry slap across the face, or in some cases, a flawless roundhouse kick. Okay, <laughs> You know weird Catholic schools, what? <laughs> yeah, but in my Catholic school, the nun's weapon of choice was embittered, passive-aggressive disapprobrium. So, to be honest, I'd have preferred the karate, 100%. <laughs> See, exactly. <laughs> it can always be worse. <laughs> and this is all perfectly sanctioned by the Lord, of course. When it comes to assaulting with impunity, the cross is just as good as a police badge. Anab. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so... When an ongoing dispute hit a fever pitch between environmental activists and the construction of a lavish megachurch, Sister Mary Margaret and her kin were ready to throw hands. Hands? I would have assumed they'd go with nunchucks. What the fuck do I know? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> <Amazing>. Yeah. <laughs> so this story comes to us from the south of France, where plans for a 26,000 square foot holy compound have been underway for seven years. The Roman Catholic group Missionary Family of Our Lady hopes to usher in godly pilgrimages to the local Catholic community of 150 Catholics. Okay. And as work slowly continues to break ground, climate activists have been fighting to preserve the lush Ardeche mountainside and protected species threatened by the massive religious center. Okay, but it's a new place for the nuns. So a, uh, a habit tat, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Even a former local archbishop, Jean-Louis Balsa, objected to the church's construction and called its size and scale, quote, disproportionate to the needs of the community. Yeah, it has a size. Got it. But, <laughs> like, I'm dying to know what he thinks the right number is or like even what the unit would be that he's using. Square right. meters per soul <laughs> is proportionate yeah. at what number? Exactly. And look, I want to admit, 
I'm not usually a huge fan of when environmental activists position themselves on the other side of building stuff, right? They're usually trying to spoil a perfectly good telescope platform so that a bird that's been dead for 50 years has a summer vacation home. But in this case... We're talking about a building that has a net negative versus an open field. Mm -hmm. So I'm team Greenpeace. Yeah, no, but and meanwhile, they're like, but if we don't tear down this forest, how will we teach people to be good stewards of God's creation? Exactly. Yeah. So, so far, activists have been able to slow down the church raising by disputing errors in the authorization forms. But back in October, when construction began in earnest, they were forced to show up in person to block excavators that were deployed to tear down protected wildlife. And then, on the second day of the protests, a group of nuns and friars assembled to thwart the protesters and protect the construction material, reflecting that famous Christian saying, what environmental destruction would Jesus facilitate? <laughs> yeah. What would Jesus do? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> so anyways, there they stood. The army of heaven on one side, army of earth on the other. But when one lone environmental protester broke through the Catholic throng and headed for an excavator, the doom music began in <laughs> earnest and it was time to draw sword for the Lord. In a viral video that you, podcast listener, can watch for free as many times I as you want. It. I'm going to say <laughs> 25 times. You can't stop greatest. watching it. You mm. can't stop. It's incredible. It's incredible. In that video, a nun can be seen giving chase and flying tackling an older protester <laughs> into a muddy ditch in a moment that would make mean Joe Green throw her a jersey to wear over her hat. <laughs> she pulls out a switchblade, but it's a ruler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hippies hold hands to block a bulldozer the nun starts whacking the hands apart. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> The tackle is so good. It's like an open field tackle. Just like it's such a, into a ditch. beautiful it's tackle. So good. It's exact. Hey, whatever you're picturing, podcast listener, it's that. It is actually the thing you're picturing. So yeah, with uh, construction still tied up in red tape, it's uncertain which side will emerge victorious. But just to be safe, protesters should probably brush up on their hand-to-hand -hand combat trading because if the nuns ever plan on breaking out the rosaries and swingable incense burners, they're in for a hurting. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Pre-recorded Heath, pre-recorded Eli, pre-recorded Marsh. Thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, half of us are going to polish off David Icke. Wait. Shoes? No. Candle? Stupid. Hey, Eli, what, what's the matter? It's Anna. She hated her Christmas presents. She did? Oh, yeah. She did that thing where she opened it and she was like, oh, fun. But then then they immediately put it super far from them, you know? Oh, ouch. Ouch, indeed. I've got to get her something really special to make up for it. Well, why don't you try tickets to God Off of Movies Live March 2nd in Orlando, Florida? Anna doesn't need tickets to the live show. She's in Just the cast. Of the do, do, the, do the ad. Yeah. I mean, God Awful Movies live in Orlando, March 2nd? That's right. Beat the winter blues with us down in Orlando for an evening of fun roasting Christian movies. And on stage shenanigans Noah can't delete from your memory. Though I wish I could, yes. And you'll wish that too, probably. And hey, if you want to get someone something really special, why not get them a platinum package, which includes a night of food, drinks, and fun with the cast? What's a better Christmas gift than gaslighting Heath into picking the wrong word during code names? am I right? It's true. So head over to GodawfulMoviesLive.com for tickets today. Thanks, Noah. You really saved my bacon. So, hey, so what were you going to get for Anna if, uh, if I didn't think of tickets? Oh, I told you, my bacon. Is that tofu? Tofu bacon? Right. Yeah. It's been almost three years since we first cracked open David Icke's Everything You Need to Know But Have Never Been Told. We chose this book on the recommendation of somehow still friend of the show, Michael Marshall. And whatever I did, Marsh, I'm fucking sorry, okay, man? I'm sorry. <laughs> and we've been slowly pecking away at it now for 1,043 days. But 
our Christmas present to ourselves this year is never having to read a goddamn word of it again. A present with Heath characteristically opened up early because he's not here for this one. Uh, as we wrap up the postscript in this final installment of Everything You Need to Nope. So, Eli, are, are you gonna are you gonna miss it? Yeah, but if the longing gets too bad, I have a cousin who I'm pretty sure is schizophrenic that I'm friends with on Facebook, so I can always get my fix on his page. Oh, well, you there know? you go. Yeah. So, yeah, so quick recap. Aliens or lizards or Jews or demons from a lower dimension via Saturn, and they're trying to feed on your sad by making everyone woke. 689 pages to get there, but that is where we got. Yeah, and also he's not mad about it. He's laughing, actually. You're crying because you lost your YouTube channel. <laughs> you are. Yes. Now, okay, so we knocked out the final chapter last time around, but since David Icke is never done talking, there's also a postscript. I guess the Illuminati did extra evil shit in the weeks immediately following his publication. Like they were holding off a bunch of their evil shit, <laughs> hoping to catch David after he'd written the book. But they exactly. did Damn it, he wrote more. It's like their week between Christmas and New Year's. And he just really right. knows really, but they, they go into overtime. Yeah. So what, pray tell, happened that was so important he had to go back into his book? Antifa shit. Uh, they, uh, Antifa apparently is an Illuminati-funded effort to start a civil war in the U.S., yeah, say what you will about reading this book, but it's definitely been like a thousand plus days of listening to the anti-SJW oldies station. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and Oh, they thought, yeah, they thought we were, yeah. So now he literally both sides Nazism, right? He's like, there are Nazi white supremacists, sure, but there are also Nazi black and brown supremacists. Yeah, no, there aren't, David. Well, you know what I mean. No, I don't. Yes, yes, you do. You're Antifa. <laughs> well, and he explains that Antifa is just like ISIS. Brown. You did know what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. They're also they're the harbinger of World War Three, Which is weird because Fa was the reason for World War II. You'd think right. they'd take more of the blame, but you no. You'd think, yeah. Oh, God, it's, it's got to be so hard to be a bootlicker and warn that all levels of government are controlled by an interdimensional evil cabal. But he manages to thread that needle nicely in this postscript. Yeah, at this point, this book's target audience is David Icke, end of list. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He, he Then he presents the heritage, not hate delusion vis-a-vis -vis the Confederate statues. He literally compares taking them down to the destruction of idols by ISIS. Sorry, David, did you say that the South worships slave owners and traders as gods and it's bad to not let them do that? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah, he refers to the Zionist Southern Poverty Law Center, in case you're wondering if he's still trying to disguise the anti-Semitism and how hard mm -hmm. he's trying. <laughs> Shockingly, he also hates the Anti-Defamation League. Ahead of his time. <laughs> and behind it. <laughs> Also, if he, he explains that if this book that we're reading doesn't sell well, that will mean that the ADL terrorists won. Oh, okay. I got it. At one point, he starts just hate listing all the venues that canceled on him in the last couple of years. And can I say, it's an impressive list of venues, right? It is. We could literally arrange a, you told David Icke to go fuck yourself live show tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be fun. We get to go to England. So, yeah, he explains that when they cancel his events, they're not even thinking of the veterans who died Obviously, face down yeah. in the muck to give <laughs> him the, the right. Yeah. No, he's got this whole long, like, I'm just a simple caveman author. How, what effect could I possibly have on world events bit? Oh, man, I wish that were true, David. I really, yeah. really wish that were true so bad. I wish you uh. were so not as important as you are. <laughs> And then, like, out of nowhere, he goes, also, when I say reptilians, I don't mean Jews. They just happen to be Zionist reptilians that control the banking system and kill Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> he suggested that the U.S. government is in the pockets of major defense contractors and banking giants, which seems like the conspiracy theorist version of when a psychic starts off by telling you that you feel stressed. Yeah, I'm just setting him gently on a shelf. I'm going to miss this here broken clock, David. <laughs> I'm going to miss it. Unless there be any single bad take meme that he neglects to say, we get a butt her email section here as well. 
Yes, which again, to be clear, David has hinted here in this book and explicitly said other places that Hillary Clinton fucks and eats babies. Yes. So in that context, her email security is lax is a weird shot to take in the postscript <laughs> right. of your book. Right. Also, he tells us that North Korea isn't all that bad. Yes. And he's right. They aren't lizards. That seems right. to be one of his big points there. Yeah. Okay. So in his left hand, he's got, there's a secret cabal of magical demons with alien technology. They control every aspect of world events. And then in his right hand, he's got, They've been targeting North Korea for regime change since 2000. I feel like that's a one or the other scenario. Yeah, what is North Korea's secret sauce here? He doesn't really give us a hint. Right. Is, it, is it parasites? Is the parasites the thing? And then he says, he's like, also global warming, still bullshit. I'm like, yeah, man, you said that in the book. You don't have to repeat that in the postscript. It, oh, did it not <laughs> stop being bullshit after the book went to print? Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> He also, he brings up Jennifer, he feels like he has to dunk on Jennifer Lawrence. He's like, well, you know, she said hurricanes were Trump's fault. I'm like, no, she she implied that electing climate change deniers made climate change worse is what she. Oh, well, I know he actually got me there because I actually get all my climate change policy recommendations from the Hunger Games press tour. I still oh, do. Okay, well, yeah. So no, that's... I'm glad there's a new one coming out. I've had no takes, none <laughs> for so long. So... But the real culprit for the hurricanes, Ike explains, is the Illuminati who are using weather controlling technology to convince you that climate change is real. Oh. He literally, he tries to qui bono hurricanes. Yeah, which is a weird move because he's not running for Congress yet. Right, so yeah, that's exactly. Like <laughs> and at this point, he just gives up on ma maintaining any kind of linear narrative through the proscript, and he descends into just listing and another things in bullet points. <laughs> yes, literally. It's just like, how are more thoughts I couldn't be bothered to sentence? Yes, there will be 14 another things here, by the way. Fuck yeah. The first bullet point, of course, is that the transgenders are out of control. He says that schools are banning skirts and mandating gender neutral shoes. Okay, look, I'll admit, I didn't really have a lot of issues with dress codes growing up, but I feel like if we could get creepy gym teachers across the country to agree that dress codes are a tool of a trans non-binary leftist android, we could prevent so much shaming and trauma. No, you know, like fair. let's let's lean into this one. Yeah, apparently he also saw a news article about DARPA teaming up with uh, somebody or another to make something called the Segmented Planar Image Detector for Electro-Optical Reconnaissance or Spider. Huh? Uh, just like the analogy that he's been using. And and the spider, the Segmented Planar, da, 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 it looks at stuff. <gasps> just like a spider does. Right. Coincidence? <laughs> Not. Yeah. And then he, he points that to a report, which he says shows that Building 7 was a controlled demolition. Weird thing to add into what is essentially the PPS of your book, David. Right. Can yeah. I throw that out there? <laughs> figure it would be front and center. He talks about the Labor Party ousting a leader just because she mused publicly on how many white women get raped by Pakistani immigrants. He says that Google, YouTube, and Facebook stole the election for Trump. Oh, David, you forgot what side you're on again. Shit. Ah, yeah. oh, David. He tells us about a petition that demands that George Soros be declared a terrorist and have all his assets seized. And I'm like, look, man, I'm all for eating the rich, but let's do it alphabetically by religion, okay? What? Okay, why do you hate atheists and Buddhists, Noah? That's no. what I'm hearing from you right now. <laughs> no, atheist isn't a religion. It's a philosophy. We're, we're, we'd be classified under none. And, and Buddhists suck. You know what I have. There it is. I knew I'd find your path. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, the, but the powers that be, he says, the powers that be are dead set against Brexit. And I'm like, well, then they're not the powers that be. They're the powers yeah, that wish you know. they could be. <laughs> God, he, he says that the EU commissioners called for a single president of the EU. And we all know that with the array of accents available there, we're virtually guaranteed to wind up with the Antichrist on that one. So there's that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think an antichrist fit into the David Icke mythology. I, I mean, I still feel like it doesn't, but he'll get it in there, right? He's like a Marvel writer. Yeah, right, really. <laughs> yeah, he says um, Whole Foods isn't competing fairly in the market. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that seems out of place. I felt like circling that in my book, right? Like I have right, to complete my placemat. 
is in the middle of writing his final words on the giant conspiracy that unites the universe. And he's like, also, that guacamole this morning was fucking insanely expensive. Six dollars <laughs> for like a little shitty thing. I just think they're fucking <laughs> ripping me off. And he, he, he closes by saying that Netanyahu is a warmongering demon. And I'm like, OK, one for 14. You know. Okay, I mean, depending on what in on it means, I'm willing to give him two for 14. So, well, you know. three, three, two, because the Whole Foods thing, yeah. The Whole Foods thing, yeah, thank you. But just because his random bullet points are over doesn't mean the book's over, because he still has one more page-long story for us. He basically, he wanted to complain about how his egregious wrongness is being made to look bad by even more egregious wrongness on other conspiracy sites. Mm-hmm. Right. He's like, he's, he basically comes right out and says, well, the key is that you make up shit that isn't debunkable. Right. He says the problem with other websites isn't that they're wrong. It's that they're so easy to debunk. I like this. It's like how occasionally we'll talk a little shop on the show for podcasters in our audience. <laughs> yeah, it's like sure. he, he's parting the curtain a little bit. There you go. And the penultimate thought of the entire book is, how dare Facebook take down my post and not the other guys? <laughs> and then the ultimate thought, the final words in this behemoth 700 page fucking book are, quote, one final, final thought. Always keep your eyes on Georgie boy, end quote, where where Georgie boy is, of course, George Soros. Yeah. And in my head, we then lowered him into a big vat of lava. Right. So that's, that's what <laughs> yeah, happened in my head. It's in my head, too. Let's take a minute. So, Eli, what's, uh, are you going to leave an Amazon review on this one, you think? I try, but the Zionists keep lowering my stars. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, they'll get you. So, okay. So, over the past years, in conjunction with this show, you have now read the Bible, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, Mama Bear Apologetics, The Case for Christ, and this pile of shit. So where does this one rank, you think? Ooh, okay. I'm pretty confident we're the only three people on earth who have read this book. So in a way, the only person it's harmed is us, which is better. So I'm going to say fifth place damage to the world, second place most unreadable, huh? Okay. Second place? All right. So wait, there were six altogether, which means there's one worst in terms of damage and one better in, or worse in terms of readability. Correct? Right. Yes, exactly. So which is which? Uh, okay. I'm going to say the Quran, harder to read. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to say that uh, the Quran, worse. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not as dangerous as the holy books, but I'm going to put it fourth most dangerous behind all of them because, like, honestly, the last decade and a half in American politics has just been an object lesson in the dangers of conspiracy thinking. And I was going to go second most unreadable after Book of Mormon. Right. What? Like, yeah, because, like, as bad as the Quran is, it's really short compared to this in the Book of <laughs> That's Mormon. Fair. It was shorter. Right? Yeah. It was. We spent a lot less time, but we had Mormon Peace Theater, the Gaw Voice. You know, I only remember the good things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I actually remember the Book of Mormon. I remember us doing bits about yeah, the Book right, of Mormon. Yeah, right. That's and that was You fun. remember the, the tight as a dish bit. That's really everything yeah, you exactly. need to remember. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. That does it. The book is closed. It shall never be opened again. But that does leave me with one final dilemma. And that is, what should I do with my copy? Because I don't want it to fall into the wrong hands. I can't abide the idea of destroying a book, even this book. But I'm afraid if I keep it, my heirs are going to find it after I die and be like, you know what? I don't want Uncle Noah's Nintendo's that bad. <laughs> That's fair. That's you know? fair. So listeners, I leave it to you. Post your suggestions on our Facebook page or email me at noillusions at yahoo.com and, uh, and put need to nope in the subject line so I can find them. If I get any suggestions I like, I'll let you know in the future. Charity auction. Okay, that's actually not a bad idea. But I'm the charity. There's the bad idea. But yes, <laughs> but barring that, this will be the last you hear of everything you need to know. Charity auction, my copy. It's a PDF I stole. <laughs> <laughs> Before we drop our ball this week, I want to thank all the listeners that made 2023 such a great year for us. I never 
have wanted to push the snooze button on a year more than I wanted to it with this one. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our Sister Show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our Half Sister Show's Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd fucking suck if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for another year of hilarious insights. I want to thank Eli Bosnick for another year of insightful hilarity. I want to thank the captivating and brilliant Lucinda Lusions for too many things to fit into this show. I also want to thank Michael Marshall from Skeptics with a K and Be Reasonable for helping us with these get ahead headlines. I also want to thank Seamus for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And if you're interested in Philly sports, be sure to check out the show notes for a link to his podcast, Philly Sports Spotlight. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous mammals, but I can't do it by name because I'm recording this a week in advance, like I mentioned earlier. But don't worry, I promise I will compliment the ever loving fuck out of you next week. The point is, though, is that together, this indeterminate number of people helped keep the show going for another year by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us for a thing you already have, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, where you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. I can speak the English words. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you spend all your money on God Awful Movies live tickets, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media and speaking social media. Tim Robertson handles that for us. Additional writing for this episode was provided by Mike Schuster and Andrea Romano, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingalias.com. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. No matter how you connect with Allstate, you're in good hands. That's because you can easily get a quote and find all our discounts at Allstate.com or by calling 888-ALLSTATE. We make getting the right coverage quick and easy. No headache involved. Just our best auto price. Visit us online or give us a call. No matter how you connect with us, you're in good hands with Allstate. Discounts vary by state and are subject to terms and conditions. All state fire and casualty insurance company and affiliates, Northbrook, Illinois. For 20 years, World Nomads has been protecting, connecting, and inspiring travelers from around the world. World Nomads offers simple and flexible travel insurance policies designed to help cover your expenses if you unexpectedly get sick or have your travel plans derailed abroad. See why over 3 million travelers have relied on World Nomads. Learn more and get a quote at worldnomads.com slash pod.